Well, this is our third week in our Voice of Hope initiative during our 60th anniversary and during the months of May through August, as you know, we're going to be demonstrating what it looks like to be a Voice of Hope in this city and beyond. So today I want to take you to a few passages that remind us of why we must do this. Why are we committed to be a church that will live by faith, be a Voice of Hope, be known by love? And so it was because of the hope giver. Our only interest in giving anybody else hope is because we're overwhelmed by the hope we found in Jesus Christ. So we want to share that hope, and he made it clear to us. Jesus made it clear to us. I want to show you that today, that we are to be hope givers. If you've read the stories of the first disciples and the people who chose to follow Jesus in that day, you know, they went along as, as they decided to follow him. They, they went along uh, to watch and observe and to uh, kind of walk with Jesus and see it all unfold. Uh, all they were invited to do was follow me. And so that's what they did. They just started following. They left businesses. They left friends. They left families because they were going to go watch Jesus as he literally would touch people, heal people, pray for people. And they wanted to watch that happen as any of us would. But in Luke 9, we get a very different glimpse of what Jesus ultimately had in mind. So if you have a Bible with you or on your device with a Bible app, let's look at Luke 9, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll go to Luke 10, 1 through 4. And these verses will also come up on the screens in all the rooms. So let me start with Luke 9, verse 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power of authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And look at this. He sent them out. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money. Don't even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Now that's a harsh word. We'll get to that in a minute. So departing, they began going throughout villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. That's what they did. Now, this was a staggering turn of events for the disciples. You know, I always like to kind of put myself into these scenarios and what might I have been saying or thinking. So if I'd been sitting there and Jesus said, okay, now I want you all to go out. You know, my first thought is, uh-uh, we, I'm, I want to watch you. I want you to do it and I'll be there to help, but I'm not, I don't want to go do that stuff. I don't think that's what I'm interested in. I'd go, well, Jesus, now wait a minute. I, you know, I want to help you. I want to serve you. I'm a detail guy. I'm your advanced guy. I'll, I'll get the details for you. Tell me what you need. I'll make it happen. I catch fish. In other words, the disciples could have said, I catch fish, you preach, and, and let's just leave it that way. That's your job, Jesus. But Jesus, no, he sent them out to preach good news, bring hope and healing to people everywhere. We are, we're, we're clear that they didn't get any advanced education. They hadn't been to seminary. They didn't really have any experience. But when God decides to use somebody, he's going to use somebody. All those things are good. But when God says, I'm going to use you to do something significant, he will. And he oftentimes just says, I'm going to send you out to do something great and spread some hope. So then Jesus makes this statement, take nothing for the journey, neither staff, bag, bread, money, don't even have two tunics. Whatever house you enter, stay there till you leave the city. And as for those who don't receive you, as you go out of the city, shake the dust off the feet as a testimony against them. Now, this is interesting. I think the first part of that, take nothing for the journey, is really helping these these first disciples learn what it looks like to live by faith. He's been talking about faith. And so he's now going to give them a chance to live by faith. And really, verse 6 tells us that's exactly what they did. They, they, they departed. They began going through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And, and it was much easier and faster to travel light in those times. Much easier. A person loaded down with stuff would not be able to keep the pace of one needing to travel quickly and travel light. It's very important. What Jesus has asked them to do is basically do what they've been watching him do. What you've watched me do, I'm now calling you to go do it. So you go do what I've been doing. 
That, and the thought might have been, well, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. So you go, you take this step of faith, and you get out there and do what I've asked you to do, and you're going to be amazed at what can happen if you'll just let me, the hope giver, have you go out and give some hope to a troubled world. And don't take too much stuff so you can travel light and quicker. William Barclay says that the more a man is cluttered up with material things, the more he is shackled to one place. Boy, that's true. I mean, we all know that. That is absolute truth. And he's right. Our stuff, our success, our money can give us this false sense of security. And I believe those who have much, which frankly in the United States is most of us, I know there's tremendous poverty around this city and around the world, but on the, on the whole with the population, we really, compared to other countries, really only know what it's like to have more than we need. And it's, it's easy to, for us to have a, a sense of security in what we have or what we can accumulate. It, it's easy to squeeze Jesus in, and, and that's a very typical thing in our culture, I believe. We're going to squeeze Jesus in. We're going to make him the God we want to serve on our terms. And which really means we really don't want to serve him. We just need to do just enough to feel like we've done just enough. I think there's times our, our stuff can get in the way. I think it's important that Jesus says, take nothing for your journey. So the 12 do as Jesus told them. And then in Luke 9, verse 10, it says they report back to Jesus. Now look at this. So in chapter 9, verse 10, it says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they'd done. They probably talked about the kind. I mean, who knows? Can you imagine they've had this incredible experience? They've gone out to do what Jesus told them to go do. And now they're going to come back and report in. I would, wouldn't that be cool to have been sit, sitting there? You know, they probably talked about the kindness that people showed them by letting them stay in their homes and providing food and a place to rest. Maybe they couldn't stop talking about all they'd seen happen in people's lives changing in the sick getting well. And maybe they processed what it was like to feel the rejection of those who did not receive them. And how hard at times it felt to shake the dust off the feet and keep moving. A little history on that. When rabbis would go to Palestine after a journey, when, the, uh, when they entered Palestine after a journey to the Gentile land, when, in other words, when the rabbis had been around those those uh, unclean Gentiles, in other words, uh, they literally, when they walked back into Palestine, they would stop and shake the dust off of their clothing, off of their feet, off of their shoes. They wanted nothing to do with Gentile, not even their dirt. So they would shake the dust off and keep moving. Now there's a time to do that for sure. But later on, Jesus would remind us that, look, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And yes, there are times we are sharing Jesus or we want someone close to us or a neighbor or a friend or an acquaintance who, who might ask us for the reason for the hope that we have, the Bible says, and we're supposed to be prepared to, to share that. But sometimes they're not interested. Sometimes they're offended. And part of it, I can remember thinking, well, we'll shake the dust off the feet, sort of, but it's a different time, and Jesus has a whole different approach now. And to me, it's always been hard to walk away and not still have compassion and concern for someone who needs the hope that I know is possible, and they're just not ready. But that's kind of the background on why they did that and what that was all about. So if you go to Luke 10, let's keep going now, Luke 10 at verse 1, it says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place for he was about to go. He sent them first. And here's what he told them. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. What do wolves do to lambs? 
It's like, well, thanks. Thank you for this great privilege of going out to be destroyed, you know. And I think what that was clearly meaning then and still now, we're going to be going out with the, this great truth of the hope of Jesus Christ into at times people who really don't want to hear it, who will be very unkind. It will not be easy. He says, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Here he, and he does it again. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. Now that seems a lot to Jesus saying, don't, don't stop and be nice to anybody. <laughs> now what, what that really, there's a little bit of history there. There's a lot more than I can even tell you right now. But basically it was when you really passed a traveler, it was kind of common that if you wanted to greet them, you might greet them, you might have some conversation, you might even have a meal together and, and be neighborly in other words. And there's nothing wrong with that. And then there's nothing wrong with Jesus saying, look, I really need you just to hang to the task. Stay on task, keep walking, be friendly, wave, but keep moving. Don't stop and let's have one of those typical greetings that would often be typical for uh, that culture. So he's not saying don't be friendly. He's just saying stay on task. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Let's go spread some hope to this world. Now notice he first sent out 12 and then he sent out 72. It might be occurring to his followers that there's a great historic significance in this request because he starts with 12 and it was not, would not be a stretch that in those days that might have called to their minds the 12 tribes of Israel caring for his people. Now he sends out 72. And for those scholars who knew of the book of Genesis, where in Greek version, there are 72 nations. So it's getting clear that Jesus is calling them to change the world. Just not our town. Just not our region. The world. So just in my simple way of saying this, and it's very simple, 12 was the first group, 72 the second group. That's 84 people who who are being told, we're going to take on the whole world. It doesn't take just a lot of intellect to realize this plan had impossible written all over it. There were probably people going, yeah, 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 you know, that's great. More power to you, that's great. 84 people, I don't think you're going to do, you know. Fool's dream. And here we are. Has it ever occurred to you we were on his mind? When those 84, 12, and then the 72 were sent out, this is exactly what God's plan was. And if they hadn't gone out, we wouldn't be here. Here's what we learn. It's on your note page if you want to write this down. There's just a couple of thoughts that jump out to me and what do I do with this information? What am I learning here? The first is this. The disciples thought their only option was to follow and observe. That's what they thought, as I said earlier. We're we're gonna, Jesus has said, come follow me. We're gonna do it. This is gonna be great. We're gonna follow him. We've heard a lot. We're We're gonna watch. We're gonna observe. We're gonna get a front row seat to God on the planet. See, the disciples thought their only option was to follow and observe. And frankly, that's all they wanted to do. But Jesus had something else in mind, and that was go and serve. Now, you're going to watch me do this, and then I'm going to send you to go out and do the same thing. And then there's three verses that really came to my mind as I was uh, thinking through this message Three verses of how important it is that we go and serve. First one is uh, James 1.22. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. But look what it says. Do what it says. That's pretty simple, isn't it? It's pretty straightforward. Maybe that's not new information to most of you. But what if we all just did what it says to do? (laughs) Just, Just do that. It's really pretty clear. Do not merely listen to the word, do what it says. 
And then there's a very sobering thought over in James 4 that came to mind. It says this, remember, it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's a sin, in other words. I can promise you, I've been very guilty at times of confessing the juicy things in my life instead of saying, Lord, I know I was supposed to speak up today, and I didn't. Lord, I know, I know my hurting friend desperately needs to know you love them. And I didn't have time. Remember, it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And then John 14, Jesus says, all those who love me will do what I say. Now, frankly, knowing this is the easy part. It's straightforward. It means what it means. It's clear. The tough part is human nature and our tendency to get wrapped up in everything else except what really matters to get wrapped up in things that are going nowhere, to get wrapped up in foolish endeavors, to get all consumed or, or defined by what we have or our status or our wealth or power, whatever that would be. And Jesus just simply says, look, do you love me? Remember when he said, do you love me to feed my sheep? All those who love me, he said, do what I say. In Matthew 9, verse 36, it says, Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion on them. Why? Because he says, they're sheep without a shepherd. These are sheep that have no one caring. These are sheep that have no one guiding or leading. These are sheep that are literally headed into the, the, the face of wolves because they don't have a shepherd to protect them. So I believe we've been given a pretty clear call as followers of Jesus, to be voices of hope. To take this good shepherd Jesus to a world where so many sheep don't have a shepherd. The stakes are high. Eternity's at stake. And all of our, frankly, rather arrogant and selfish agendas, I think, if you're like me, you've got to work hard to set those aside, to eradicate them so my focus can be where God wants it to be, whether I'm a pastor or not, and set aside the things that distract us, that eat up so much of our time and energy and have no meaning or purpose, so we can do what God has called us to do. I close with an example of what I've been talking about. We have a lot of mission efforts in this church, as you know. A lot is going on here. In fact, uh, this last week, last Thursday, Crossings received an award from the Oklahoma City Public Schools as the best community partner for the year in faith-based nonprofits. There were nine finalists, and we won it. Now, that's not why we do it. We don't pay much attention to that. I'm telling the family now because it stays in-house. We don't go blow that horn or, or uh, do press releases. And what's interesting is we were nominated by the principal of Eugene Field Elementary School where we have about 70 volunteers every week serving in that school and then about another 280 who come in when bigger opportunities are available and we need more help. That's just one of our schools. There are others. And this is the third time we've been given this award from all of us, all those times nominated by our partner schools where we've been serving. The club at Crossings won the award for the John, from John Marshall High School. They nominated this. Uh, several years back, our efforts at Stan Wadey Elementary School. We don't do it for that. We don't do it for the applause of men. We don't do it for attention. We talk about it in-house in among our own huddle, but we don't go outside and try to blow that horn. If they want to blow it, they can. We can't stop them. But I tell you that simply to say, being a voice of hope matters. It matters. One of the other things we do, as you're well aware of, is opening a crossing satellite church inside the Joseph Hart prison. Really from day one, it was full. 
Their chapel is a, a very small room. It might seat maybe 80 people, 80 or 90. And um, they were kind enough to clear the tables and chairs out of the visitation room, the, the, uh, the inmates who are, are our, campus, our campus pastor and our volunteers and at Joseph Harp. They, they take all that stuff down, move it out of the way every Sunday afternoon. And we can get 210 of us in that room. I, I said this before, I think, and uh, the hardest part of going down there on Sunday evenings is when you get there and you see that long line of men lined up to come to church. And uh, I watch them fill that room and they, they try so hard to, I mean, you know, before we get stopped or something to say, no, no, that's beyond code, you can't do that. They've been kind to let us get, as you know, 210, 12, 15. <laughs> but every week since we started, Every week, when that door closes, there's still a line of guys down the sidewalk. Every week. So the thought came to my mind, and only God could have thought of this, I think. Um, what if we were to build a chapel down there? It's, there's a place on the prison yard for that where they build chaplains in some of the prisons. There's a piece of land set aside that says chapel on the blueprint. And I thought, well, what would that look like? Could, and I remember asking the warden, I thought, let's not go anywhere with this. Now, don't get too excited. I haven't told anybody yet. I haven't even talked to the elders yet. <laughs> get forgiveness later. <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, the elders lead the way. They lead the way in all this. Well, the warden looked at me and said, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay. So we're thinking and, and uh, we're, we're going to see what happens. We're going to do some, our homework on a couple of things, as you know, are going on right now. And then we're going to come to you this, this fall, early September. And uh, we don't want to nickel and dime you. We're going to come all at once and say, okay, here's our Voice of Hope initiative in our 60th year to go do some really significant things, all of which are located off-site. They're out there where God is doing some things in different places. So you know we went out there to Joseph Harp two weeks ago for their first year anniversary as a church, as a crossings church. Well, the word got out among the guys too that there was this talk maybe about a chapel that it would have more room. And so they did something at the beginning of our, pro, our worship service last uh, two weeks ago that I wasn't sure I was going to be able to function beyond. I, a part of me wanted to just collapse, wanted to cry uncontrollably. I think that was scared those guys to death, so I tried to hold it together. They, at the start of our service, presented Crossings Church with a $1,000 building fund tithe for the new chapel. <laughs> I guess we're gonna build it. <laughs> And then, two days later they called and said a bunch more of the guys wanted to get on that and they're sending another $1,300. $2,300 has been pledged toward a building. I guess we're assuming we're gonna be able to build it. If God's in it, we'll do it, but we're gonna talk about it this fall. I think we can get it done, all right? That's what I hope we can do. I think we can get it done. So let me just take you there a couple of minutes. I'm gonna show you some video that we shot while we were down there celebrating our one year anniversary with the guys at Joseph Harp. Have a look at the screens. Well, there's a lot of words that could describe this afternoon. Um, incredible, unbelievable, awesome. But I think uh, the best way to describe it is only God. Have you come to praise the Lord? Man, amen. But today is Crossing's one year anniversary here at Joseph Harp Correctional Facility. Man, you know, we have all the volunteers that, who have been coming for the last year. So to have Crossing's come down here and do something like this for men like us, who, you know, society would look at and say, we don't deserve something like that. And it's nice to know that people are, are going against the norm and coming out here and showing us love. It's just, it's wonderful. 
On Easter Sunday, April 1st, 2018, Crossings, uh, Joseph Harp was launched, not as a prison ministry, but as a campus. So it's just a blessing to be able to be a part of that and to, to see God at work here at Joseph Harp and so many men's lives just change in a radical way for Christ. We want you to know the impact that Crossings has had on this place. So over the last year, these men have collected $1,000 as a seed offering. So I sit back and I watch you guys uh, with your hands in the air and praise the Lord and uh, do what you do, worship into your faith. I want to tell you, thank you very, very much for taking that chance in your own life to make that decision to, to walk that path. For when you get back out of incarceration, you become that dad, that father, that son, that uncle, whoever you are to somebody. No matter what we've done, what our lost and lie may be, but we all matter at some point, in some way, and all of us are gonna make a difference in somebody else's life. And that's what we're here to do because God has empowered us to change lives. It doesn't matter if you have orange, blue, or you walk out the door tonight, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to change lives, to impact people in a meaningful way that only you can as a believer in Christ. And I think in 2019, it's time to start living like it, amen? And you are crossing Joseph Hart, so give yourself a round of applause. We're just stunned at your kindness and letting us into your life. We live two very different lives. We know that. Don't take for a minute, I'm coming in here pretending like I have some clue what life is like for you. I don't. But one thing I do know, in this world, we have trials of many kinds. In this world, we're separated by all the things we are or aren't. We're this, we're that, we're black, we're white, we're right, we're wrong. That's how this world works. And it's getting uglier all the time. But I want you to understand something. We are members of another kingdom. We are truly one in God's kingdom. And so we are thankful that you allow us to come to you. We're here to stay. We're not going away. All right, we are here to stay. So we get to be a voice of hope. How awesome is it that we have an opportunity to be a voice of hope, to not talk about it, to not think about it, but do it. And that's exactly what Jesus has in mind for all of us. The church is not something you come to, it's something you go from. And I don't think there's ever been a better vision on the planet like the vision Jesus has for his church. So I just pray church will continue to be open and ready for where God seems to be leading us. And right now, he seems to think there's a lot more we can do. I'm gonna ask you to stand in all our rooms, if you would stand, and we're gonna close in prayer. I'm gonna invite the prayer teams to come to the front of each room. Perhaps you walked in here today and you need a dose of hope. Would you give us the privilege of praying for you or with you before you head out to your cars? Maybe you walked in here today and, and carrying a very heavy burden. There's so many tough things going on in the families in this church. The prayer list is both a privilege and heartbreaking each week. So perhaps you've been, had a tough, tough week and you just need to be encouraged or you need to let somebody just pray that God could be real to you in the storm you're in, whatever it may be. And maybe you wanna come and say, God, I'm ready to be used by you. Make me a hope giver. Whatever it may be, as soon as I pray and if people are walking out of the rooms, you come to the front of that room and we'll have prayer together. Let's pray. Father, we're beyond thankful for the privilege we have to be your children, to know the truth that has set us free, and then be given the privilege of helping others get free as well. Father, we're willing. We pray for willing hearts and attitudes. Take all that we are, all that we have, and use it to bring hope to the world, to bring a shepherd to lost sheep. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.